People, my people, welcome to the uh, first time I've actually done an interview over my phone via the uh, magical thing called video camera. And it's with Nathan from Endangered Distilling Co. Nathan was kind enough to give me about half an hour to explain the ethos behind the Endangered Distilling Co, which takes bakery day old bread and other products that would end up in the landfill and turn them into um, happiness, booze. This is their fruit juice gin, which is made from leftover fruit and vegetable juices, fermented, produced a wicked brew. So without any to do, I will jump in for you to get, let Nathan do the talking. But it begins with me having a bit of trouble um, managing 21st century technology. Catch, catch ya, like, subscribe. <laughs> Nathan. G'day. Sorry, I haven't done this before. I'm just trying to. Oh, there we go. Okay. How are you? I'm good. I'm about to hit. Uh... No, I'm trying to expand so I can actually record you. Okay, let's see how this works. Yep. This is the reason why I married a, um, a Gen Y. <laughs> My wife's a fair bit younger than me, so. That way I actually figure out. Oh, excellent. We are recording. Yes, excellent. Glad to catch up with you. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro. So people, my people, today I'm introducing and interviewing Nathan from Endangered Distilling Co. in Tasmania because Nathan and the Endangered Distilling Co. do something that I hadn't heard of before, which is they turn, I understand, uh, leftover fruit juice and bread and that into first great booze of this variety remember this so yeah people my people i give to nathan nathan thank you very much for joining booze news and reviews and the playlist from the still so i'm going to look up the questions i actually found to ask you and we can run from there perfect okay um the one thing i've got to ask is basically Tell us about yourself because your background. Um, I'm coming across an awful lot of people in the distilling industry who <laughs> aren't distillers. So what's what's your background in the industry or lack thereof? Um, so we, there's four of us, I guess, four of us that uh, own Endangered Distilling Co. We all met work in hospitality, um, bars, restaurants, um, et cetera. Mm. Um, and from there, we uh, developed a kind of a mutual kind of, um, well, we basically didn't want to work for someone else for the rest of our lives. That's kind of what kind of bound us together. Um, moving from hospitality and bartending specifically into the local distilling industry. Um, so have worked, um, have been trained on the job um, prior to, to doing it ourselves. Um, or uh, the majority of us have anyway. So um, where, where did you do your training? Uh, sorry? Where did you do your training? I was lucky enough to work at Sullivan's Co for a few years. Lucky you. <laughs> yeah. Was, was gig. Um, started out in the kind of hospitality side of their operations in the, the setting up like a tour program for their cellar door uh, and then moved into production um, after that. Oh, fantastic. My um my main qualification for doing this is um I've got twins. I've got two nine year olds, so um during lockdown we were we're drinking a lot of it, so it's a case of okay, if you're drinking a lot of it, you may as well start reviewing it. Totally, absolutely. <laughs> um I have a Saudi friend who um being Saudi, she was dry and I looked and went, Okay, we're knocking through two or three bottles of gin a week. Um, how are you coping? And she looked at me and went I stress bake. The entire family was gaining weight because she was baking up scones and cakes and that by, by the by the storm. I mean, her house smelled wonderful, but um, oven. that oven was getting a fair flogging. So, so, so it's like um, you know, like you come into the industry from somewhere else. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to go off a bit track. Um, 
and jump a question. What made you guys decide to use the um, leftover juices and bagels and that rather than going the um, track of pretty well every other distiller who I know gets their ethanol in by the um, 100 litre drum? How come? Uh, coming from that, hosp with that hospitality background, um, you see an awful lot of food waste. Um, it's pretty demoralising, among other things within within that particular industry. It's a cruel mistress, but one that we're we're a huge fan of. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's just you know why not? Um, you know, you're turning something that's destined for the waste cycle, giving it value and turning it into something else, I think is um, well. If, if more people had that kind of train of thought rather than just throwing things away. Society is, is very much a throwaway society these days. So the project's about as much as much about raising awareness and promoting conversation. And we're not going to solve the world's problems by doing what we do. But if we can get people to start thinking about changing the way they look at things in their mindset about what happens when they're done with something, um, you know, maybe someone else will. Um, I hear you. I um. I compost at my place and all our vegetable um, matter, you know, ends up growing Jerusalem artichokes in my back, backyard. Um, and then they eventually get given away to charity. So we we got a choice in our place, even my own home, of throwing a whole lot of stuff into my, my rubbish bin a week or actually then recycling it into Jerusalem artichokes, which ends up, um, I give it to a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen. So yeah, great. I understand the, um, the ethics. Um, I mean, there's a choice to be made. And I think quite often with these um, issues that present on a global scale, you know, that cause issues on a global level, there's always this, oh, what I do isn't going to change anything. It doesn't matter whether I, as an individual, recycle or, you know, kind of, it's just it, everyone has a choice to make. And I guess we're just trying to show or demonstrate that through what we're doing. Um, look, I think, uh, <coughs> sorry, the late much loathed Joseph Goebbels put it this way of, um, he was only interested in two numbers and they said, oh, which one? He get, they get a million. He goes, oh, I'm not interested in a million or 10 million or, you know, <coughs> sorry. He said, I'm interested in ones and zeros. Cause if you take a one and then you put a zero beside it, you've got a 10. If you work another yeah. zero, you've got a hundred. And that's the way it worked. He said, look, it's not terribly complicated. All you've got to do is just. Look at the small small picture and then just add on to it. It's you know, yeah. it's you and I, at, at, or uh, at two people. Um, but if you get fifty of us or a hundred thousand of us as individuals all deciding that we're going to do something or not do something, then you begin to have a um, a, a global movement and a, a sustainable ability. I mean, I did international relations, and every last rebellion I've ever come across starts with often a platoon leader just turn around saying, I'm not following this order. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not I'm not going to shoot into this crowd. I'm not going to do this. And then changing his mind. And it starts with one guy going, nah, not doing this today. Um, I don't agree with this. And then it spreads. And all of a sudden, you know, entire regimes are in trouble because of one person. And I think that, yeah, your idea is very much the same, is that if one person plus one person plus one, one enough one people decide that they're going to do something different with their leftover bread for the weekend, then we can have a um, sustainable change. Yeah. That's, yes. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs>